Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Andy Cruikshank. I'm the Associate Director of Nursing for Quality Improvement in Elft. And I'm Jen Pollock. I'm one of the QIA working So for the next hour, we're going to take you through a bit of a canter, at a bit of a canter, is that the term, Ellis? Yes. At a bit of a canter, uh, through the, these concepts around scale up and spread. There's a bit of interaction, hopefully generate some questions. Um, and I guess at the end, what we're hoping you go away with is a sense of perhaps what you would need to focus on if you're thinking about scaling up and spreading any interventions. It's worth starting with the idea though that scale up and spread of interventions is essentially the scale up and spread of uh, underpinning ideas, theories, and uh, then the improvements and innovations that, that go with that. And it stems from the, the work of uh, of, of testing and learning to accelerate the pace at, at which you uh, improve. It's about adapting and changing the patterns of work and relating in order to improve whichever sphere of activity you're involved in, whether that is you know, frontline clinical services or, or more um, office functions or uh, operational support. And the idea being that through this sequence, and we use the model for improvement, other models are available, but the reason they, they all have something in common which is that you're, you're learning uh, quickly and don't get so stuck uh, with dogma and routine. In terms of the flow of ideas of, of uh, improvements from one context to another, it's not usually uniform. Ideas tend to pull, they get attracted to certain places and stay there and don't go to others. And, and one of the, the issues with spread is that it, it means that you may not get sufficient coverage across systems and that teams may not be immersed in the change idea enough for it to, to really take hold and for them to make it their own. It can work, but it can be haphazard. And, and so it feels very inexact uh, as a, as, a, as a process. Scale up is a more deliberate approach uh, and it takes a, a different if related emphasis. Uh, the focus in this sense is how to nurture improvements across settings uh, to, minimize the, to maximise the benefits at scale and tackle the tendency of improvement to exist in isolated islands of practice. And we see this a lot as you may have noticed that this team do really well, this team not so much for reasons we can't quite fathom. Uh, the typical and traditional framework within the health service to achieve this has been largely industrial in terms of assurance and performance. Um, and whilst it, m it is true that the thinking behind a change in practice or policy is driven usually to make that system safer and more reliable, it can miss important elements of what some theorists simply call practical judgment, which is a way of and I guess my interpretation of that is, what can I do now that will help? And often ideas are generated, for example, risk assessments and so forth, that are meant, the intention there is to change an outcome, but in fact the risk assessment becomes the industry, not the, the focus on the outcome. So most change then occurs at a, a, a micro or interpersonal level. And that's very important for what's to come for the rest of this uh, presentation. However, when lots of people are together, you have to work with the disjunction between an espoused strategy, the thing you're trying to do, uh, and the work in reality. It requires consistent nudging, nurturing and effort in order to shape it into a form resembling the intended outcome. So this image shows an intention. It's how an improvement might scale up from uh, one ward out of 16 in a hospital to the entire hospital and then from one hospital to a hospital in each region and then from a hospital in each region to a national uh, delivery of an improvement. That makes it sound very straightforward <laughs> and, and in some respects simple. I was working out how to do it and whether an improvement can work, move to scale is, is enormously important. And it seems that to do this, all the different pieces in the process seem, need to work together 
in order to achieve our aim. So we need to create the right form out of our intentions. It needs to look right. It needs to sit comfortably in the system and there needs to be movement all the time. However, the spread of improvements can follow a strange and enigmatic path um, if it's left to chance. So Jane's going to tell you a story. So yeah, let's tell a story. Here we have a gentleman by the name of James Lancaster, who was a captain, a seafaring cap, back in the end of the 16th century, early 17th century. And uh, he was quite a progressive person, because at the time, there were very big challenges around um, issues of scurvy. It was the biggest cause of death of, of sailors, much higher than warfare, much higher than anything. Um, and, and he hit upon this idea of citrus fruits. And actually, he carried out a little experiment. He was on a voyage to India with four ships. He gave his biggest ship, the intervention ship, all the sailors three teaspoons of lemon juice a day. And we all know probably what happened. No fatalities from scurvy. The other three ships, he left. Control ships, no intervention, 110 of 278 dead from scurvy. So, unquestionable evidence there, really. Black and white, you could say. But how long do you think it took for the provision of citrus fruits to become standard practice in the British Navy? Can we have some estimates from the room? What do you reckon? Five years? Ten years? Fifty years? Hundred? Two hundred? Three hundred? Okay, okay. Pessimists, perhaps some realists in the audience. Okay, well, let's see. I'll tell you the rest of the story. What happened was this. There he is, 1601, light bulb moment. It was 150 years before anything really happened with this, okay? And it was, um, this guy was a physician working in the Navy. His name was James Lind, and uh, he knew of Lancaster's findings and he thought he would do some more testing of them. He came up with something even more sophisticated, which was with people who had scurvy, he thought he'd try a range of different interventions. One of them, of course, being citrus fruits. The others, now this was luck of the draw, I'll tell you what, luck of the experimental design. The other three were half a pint of seawater a day, <laughs> six spoonfuls of vinegar, a quart of cider, some nutmeg, or 75 drops of something called vitriol elixir, uh, which may work for diarrhea, I think, but, but not for much else. So that's what he did. And uh, unsurprisingly, the people who had citrus fruits were, of course, okay. Um, they ended up caring for the rest of them, basically, on this, on this ship. And they ran out of oranges and lemons within a few days, so not very well planned at all. Um, but that was 1747, and you know, that was James Lynn's findings. Not till 1795 was this actually adopted as standard practice throughout the British Navy. And what about broader scale up? Because of course, we've got other maritime industries like trade. What do you reckon? How long before this scaled up again to those industries? Well, there we have it, another 70 years before the British, British Board of Trade. Um, adopted these findings and made it standard practice. So we're talking about 264 years for that whole scale up, when the evidence was really pretty clear cut in the beginning. So I think this is telling us something that we need to reflect on today, which is that strong evidence is not enough, absolutely not. It's necessary, but it is not sufficient to result in adoption. We use um, Roger's seminal work here, the diffusion of innovations, as a, as a reference when we're thinking about this, this work. And, in, and it's, we're going to go through some of the concepts that uh, he uses. Many of you may be familiar with this already, which would be great because you can help us out. Um, but he's really helped, this, this work has really helped us frame our, our thinking. Um, it's not perfect. It has its flaws, not least that most of the evidence is gathered, uh, all the studies are retrospective, there's not much experimentation within it that's, that's as active. So it tells us what's, what works uh, with hindsight, and that is perhaps one of the biggest flaws of strategy. Is uh, a chap called Binney that quote, uh, quote from him that the dirty little secret of strategy is that it's always clear with hindsight. 
And really what I think he's driving at is the idea that what you end up with is not necessarily where you thought you would be. Um, but it does offer some great insights into how to help us steer and nudge people in the, in the right direction. So you may have seen some of this language. We talk about innovators, early adopters, uh, early majority. And most of us, you know, want to be cool and be with the innovators and early adopters most of the time because that's where it's at, yeah, apparently. I uh, have to say, I probably spend quite a bit of my time being a laggard of some description or another. Uh, and I would argue that most people do. And actually, the language here, there is a tendency to say that all improvement happens at that end and we don't really have to pay much attention to this end. I would argue strongly that, yes, we can be pro-innovation. Yes, we can be pro-early adoption, all those things. But more than that, we need to look at this whole spectrum and be pro-improvement across the whole thing. So when we're thinking about that, we need to think about time. So if we consider that time is on the, the axis here, and this is your market share, so that would be an entire ward team or entire group of population of, of patients or entire hospital and so on, you can see that it takes time to bring the people who are laggards along with you. Now that may not happen because they don't want to change. It may be that they can't. And we know from lots of different spheres of innovation that that can happen for a variety of reasons. That could be that they don't have a choice to innovate. If you don't have the money to buy something, then you can't be one of the innovators. So there is a risk of exclusion in this. And so we need to be very careful about the, the way we approach it and not simply brand laggards as, as the people who can't be bothered or are disinterested or too old fashioned. For sure, there's an element of that from time to time. Myself, not excluded from that. If you look at what the main uh, development or the main adoption of innovations in technology were through the 20th century, most of that follows an increase in wealth. That's what we tend to see. So socioeconomic factors are a big driver for, for innovation with a bit of a dip around about the, the Second World War, actually. But generally, the, the pace has increased with the use of uh, mobile phones and internet and so forth. It's important to think about that because one frame of reference would be the wealthier you are, the more able you are to uh, adopt innovation. And that's just not true. That's, that's not true at all. And in largely, a lot of the innovations and improvements we're engaged in involve conversations and uh, engaging in some forms of dialogue and changing our, our, the way we see something, that kind of thing. The last time I checked, I didn't think that cost very much to do. So, how about some innovations that are in the process of spreading? Um, we like to have a think now about social media. So, they are not at the top of the S-curve. They haven't got to that point yet. They are actually around about here, the UK population right now. Um, Twitter is used by about 32 million people, so about half uh, the country. Um, sorry, Facebook is. Twitter, less so. Twitter is uh, about 20%. Okay? That's where they are at the moment across the UK. But I'm interested to know, how about in this room? Um, Twitter, Facebook, and what about what we're all here for? QI. I'm going to do some exercises now to explore this a bit further with you, to get you up doing something a little bit more interactive, not just listen to us talk at you. Um, so with these, these innovations then, first thing is to find out how diffused they are amongst you at the moment, okay? And then we're going to do a more exciting exercise. So first step, on your chairs when you came in, or, um, under. or possibly on the floor, you'll see some envelopes. Hopefully all your envelopes have some stickers in them. Three stickers. <laughs> yeah, if your envelope doesn't, put your hand up. Because we did have some that were sort of left in here from the last group. So hopefully we've got you all fresh ones. Okay. So what you need to do is, following my lead, Andy's lead, uh, if you're users of these innovations, we would like you to put stickers. Some are visible for others to see. So Facebook is a red sticker. Twitter is a blue sticker. And if you're involved in a QI project, that's a yellow sticker. 
And those of you who are involved will know we like our definitions with QI, and there it is at the bottom to clarify for you exactly what we mean. You might be a project team member, you might be a sponsor, you might be elf or not elf. That's what we mean by that. Okay, you're involved in some way. So you might end up with no stickers, one, two, or three. Everyone done step one. Anyone happy? Anyone not happy? Okay. Step two, of course, that's where we are, that's our baseline. Can we, uh, can we diffuse any ideas any further today? So you're going to do an exercise where you're going to be having conversations with each other about these different areas of innovation. And you will need to be in small groups of two to four people for this. And basically, you need to ensure that you have at least one person who's a user of one of these innovations and three uh, and others who aren't. So if you're a group of four, you might have one user, three not, two, two, or three users, one not. That's all fine. And you're just going to be talking about one of, the one of the innovations at a time. So you should have some options with your combinations. Just talk about one at a time. The objective is existing users to be sharing your experience of using these innovations. Why do you do it? What is it about it? Why do you bother with it? and see if you can you know, convince others to consider changing their behaviour around these. Right, so we're going to give you 10 minutes or so for this exercise and um, it's, you're slightly bigger than our last group but there's still a bit of space at the front so I'd encourage you maybe to you know, stand up, find some new people, um, get yourself a bit of space to have a little chat and I'm going to stop you in about five minutes to move you around a bit further. Okay. Right, go for it. <laughs> So, we're going to get your feedback on that in a moment, but firstly, we'd like to give you a little bit more theory from Rogers to, to hang some of that conversation on. So, what affects the rate of adoption of a new idea? So, this, 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 uh, this concept, this relative advantage, um, I think it's best characterised by a, a comment from a staff nurse when uh, they were trying to, well, they were being convinced, for want of a better term, that they should complete uh, a particular form. And they just turned around and said, why should I? What's the relative advantage of that? Now, that's important to think about because relative advantage is, uh, is much about uh, social prestige. It's about convenience. It's about satisfaction. And that's every bit as important uh, uh, um, as objective evidence, so taking the Scovy example. So if people didn't understand the why should I bit, then of course you could die of scurvy. Seems absurd, but seems to be the case. The example of the mini disc that we have here, does anyone remember the mini disc? <laughs> Did anyone have a mini disc? Oh, wow! <laughs> Amazing. We've got some innovators over there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you are the innovators <laughs> in the room um, around this. So they didn't ta really take off because there was a, if you remember, we went from the, the cassette uh, Walkman to the Discman portable one. This is the late 80s, I'm thinking now. Um, and then as soon as that started to gain some foothold, the MP3 player came along and killed off the poor old Discman, the poor old mini-disc. So the relative advantage was slight for that, so it didn't take, okay? The, the idea that it, it didn't fit. Compatibility is another one. So compatibility really speaks to the culture of an organisation or a country or whatever and the adoption of a, an innovation within that context. So compatibility is the beliefs, the values, the habits, the social norms and all of those things that people adhere to. And, and this is the distribution um, or the percentage of women using uh, modern birth control globally. 
And I guess if you think about the different cultural contexts there, you can begin to see why the, the distribution might be, uh, might be different uh, from, from continent to continent, basically. So it, I'll just come back to that, actually. It's imp important here because if something is incompatible, it creates tension. It creates a dissonance. So, it doesn't, so an idea won't be accepted. It will be rejected pretty quickly. How old is that stuff? Uh, fairly old. <laughs> <laughs> fairly old. I can't remember off the top of my head, to be honest. Um, does anyone, a, anyone ever come across a Dvorak keyboard? No, no. A O E U I, etc. Yeah. What? <laughs> so the traditional, what's called the QWERTY keyboard, was developed for the mechanical typewriter. It was developed specifically so that you didn't type too fast, and the hammers that would hit the ribbon would have enough time to hit the ribbon and come back. If you, had it, if you type too fast, you get that mess of those hammers. So, of course, then when personal computers come along, they, they, they develop this, which is actually much more intuitive to use, but it seemed to be very complex because it's a change too far. People are not ready for it. So many people have got used to typing using and touch typing using the QWERTY keyboard that this doesn't take off at all. It's, it's not seen to, to fit the model. Exactly. That's exactly. exactly how people felt. Even though our QWERTY keyboard was designed to have a lag in it. It was designed inefficiently for our use today, but it was what they needed at the time. Yeah. So exactly what you're saying is the issue. To relearn was too complex for people. Yeah. So trialability is important. And this is really, for us, where a lot of the, the benefits of improvement science come in because you can work out how things work. You can play with them, modify, and so forth, and, and make them your own. So the trialability is an important feature. I think that, is that noise from next door, or is it us? Is that next door, that hum? Okay. Um, observability. So in California, what they discovered was that if uh, a person in a neighborhood had solar panels installed and they're very big on their, their green energy program there. If, if somebody had, in the neighbourhood had solar panels in, installed, they would normally contribute to six other people installing uh, solar panels. So kind of keeping up with the Joneses maybe, there's a bit of that. But there's also a, an element here of seeing what it looks like. Is that what I thought it would look like? Is that acceptable to me? And there's that kind of aesthetic view as much as anything else. And, it, and obviously in our world we're thinking about the kind of evidence that we produce and whether people can actually see that and, and have, have real contact with it. So Rogers, as well as those attributes of innovation, he also had some insights around how people experience change and uh, we find these okay. very useful as well. So we've talked about this, this curve in terms of people's readiness for, for new stuff. Um, once you get past the innovators, our mini disc users at the back there, for the rest of the population, something that's very powerful is concerns about risks and concerns about uncertainty of, of new ideas. That's, that's very strong. And it means, therefore, that if you're going to pull these people into it, which you need to do, and you know, this is a big chunk here, then there's a need for reassurance and trust in, in what you're doing. There are a lot of different ways you can, you can build that. Something that we found very, very powerful is actually about peer-to-peer connection. Essentially what we were just doing with you then. You know, in a room with people you can identify with, um, sharing of experiences. That's, we think, really, really quite powerful in terms of um, the spreading of innovations, fostering that conversation. And another key insight of his is about the need to enable people to reinvent innovations. It's really important that people don't feel like it's a lift and shift and it's just being dropped in them to do. 
but actually making them feel empowered and part of reinventing it, you know, for their own context, where it, it will need that as well, enabling them to, to be creative with that. And we've got examples of all of this in a moment that we'll share with you because we've definitely seen a lot of evidence of the power of this. So, with that sort of theory, we're interested to know from your conversations earlier whether you can feel any, any of these, these attributes or any of these drivers um, in terms of how people experience change. So just give you a moment to reflect on your conversations having had that theory. So, some hands up to, to give us a steer. So could anyone detect the relative advantage of an innovation that they were being persuaded to take on? Could you, could you, were you persuaded? Was anyone persuaded to try something new? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So, this very nice lady uh, <laughs> next to me. Sorry. Oh, oh, very good. Sorry, Nicholas, oh, sorry, it was loud enough. Nicholas sitting next to me was very persuasive about uh, some of the uh, benefits of tweeting. Um, I might even go and try it now, because she doesn't Fantastic. have two heads. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Identifying with Nicola on that. Lovely. How about compatibility? Was anyone feeling a sense? Were they surprised that maybe this was more compatible with their values? Or were they feeling a bit of a resistance? Feeling, no, this isn't for me. Anyone finding that in their conversations where they're trying to persuade people? Hands up if you don't want to feedback. No? So it was an interesting one because actually it came up in our group that we, wouldn't, we would be the laggers. With certain things like Facebook, it was more about connectivity with family, but we wouldn't actually engage in it. Um, Twitter, it was more about work as opposed to personal. Yeah. Um, and so I think what we kind of like talked about was the difference. As an improver, it's kind of like an improvement skill hmm. of going through that process of change. And that was just interesting. Just an interesting thing. Great. Yes, very helpful. Simplicity or complexity. So I confess I'm, a, I'm definitely in the late majority laggard end of adoption of social media. Um, just looked like a lot of effort to me to have to tell somebody what I'd eaten for dinner <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. So I, you know I, I didn't really I didn't really find that uh, I thought it just seemed to be too complex for, for something that you could just talk to somebody about, couldn't you? Does anyone else feel really blocked by passwords? The need for passwords for everything. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a big barrier for me. I struggle with that one. <laughs> so trialability? Anyone going to try something now? Have you heard that something? Yeah. You're going to see what it's like? I suppose a bit like you, like in, the sound, in terms of... Um, not engaging with social media as much. And actually, I think I've been convinced to tr probably try Twitter, which I didn't think uh, would be compatible with myself, but um, I thought at least to try it. So the idea planted to at least give it a try, yeah. whilst before I was like, Definitely not interested. No. Yeah. Wouldn't even consider it, Fantastic. yeah? Wow, that is really showing just one conversation with a peer on that. Is anyone else feeling, is anyone else feeling they actually might do something differently after today, just out of interest? No? Okay, Carl? cool. Uh, I think you probably hear me. I, I, I can shout. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, Thank it's, you. It's, it's actually for the, ca um, for the camera. We're uh, live streaming. Live voice. Um, well, I was thinking about innovation journeys. It's also about um, making decisions of when you're going to stop doing something. And um, the Facebook innovation, start using it, starts looking at it, start thinking, actually, is this what I want? Yeah. And deciding not to do it is probably as important as starting on a journey, deciding when it's not going to work, and the PDSA cycle so it fits in with that. Yeah, that happens too. In the previous group, we definitely had one group which had talked themselves out of something, um, which was fascinating. Um, how about these two at the bottom? The peer-to-peer -peer element of this. So that was one thing, obviously, we were really manipulating. The fact, having those conversations with each other, we've got a lady here who feels that that was actually very powerful. Did, did it feel powerful? Arms up if, if that felt powerful as a way of, of, of thinking about 
new behaviours. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Great. Well, let, let us give you some more examples now from our, our own experience. So, um, this idea, watch I don't have an accident, this idea talks to the, uh, the principle that if you look at something as optional, that's, can I change something? Can I do something different? So that's the, the kind of, will I do this? Will I not do this? Will I continue to use Facebook or not? That's a personal thing. Collective, that's more, can we do this? Will we do this together? Can we make a decision about something? And authority is, you will do that, or you must do that, or it it's, it's comes from uh, instruction. There are different ways of diffusing uh, ideas and scaling up uh, across uh, different environments. And what we can see is optional follows natural diffusion, so just conversation, much as you've done this morning, um, and campaigns, so advertising and so on. You know, will you buy this product or that product? Can you make that decision based on the, the relative merits of the thing you're looking at? What we see, though, is between collective and authority, there's actually a lot of crossover. So the idea that you can do stuff collaboratively in that sort of true flattened hierarchy sense of uh, it being collective. But equally, there's the idea that you've got, an I you've got a principle. So if you go back to the example of the Navy, actually I wonder what would have happened if all the, all the right people were in the room to talk about how much this mattered to them and what the impact of scurvy was on the population of sailors. And so it gives you some idea of what the problems were, I guess within the Navy at that time. But so the, the idea then is you would have extension agents maybe, people who would tell you how to do things and get you engaged in that process. Authority fits more with executive mandates. That's a kind of more traditional model. And what we can see is there's actually plenty of room for hybrid models uh, within this. So I guess the principle here is that there is no one way to scale up in, t in terms of uh, method. It's fitting it to the circumstances, the prevailing circumstances that you're in, working out what the best strategy would be for a particular group in a particular situation. And if you think about things like emergency mobilization and the kind of innovations that come out of that, um, you know, if you look at uh, situations of famine and, and disaster and so on, you can see that actually the learning that comes from those uh, experiences for the organizations, but also for the communities involved is often incredibly uh, powerful, uh, aside from all the trauma that's involved. So the important thing for us is really to say that there is a, a crucial element here about how we make connections with each other around this and how different areas within the system, different levels of the system, different disciplines, different grades or however you want to characterise it, come together and have an opportunity to create some dialogue about the issues. Okay, so our last bit then is to connect this with some of the stuff we've done at ELFT. And Andy and I have both been involved in leading this work on violence reduction over the last, in my case, two years, Andy's five years. So I'm going to kick off because it is a story about Andy in the beginning. He was there with his mini disc. No, he didn't have a mini disc. <laughs> but he was very much the innovator in 2012 with the Globe Ward team. Globe Ward is one of our acute admissions wards in Tower Hamlets. And five years ago, you know, this really was um, very much new ground. Um, in terms of the trust, uh, we had had um, uh, some very, very serious patient safety incidents um, in 2010, 2011 in, in Tower Hamlets. Um, the most serious incident, really, I think, that anyone can imagine uh, involved a, a service user actually killing another service user on one of our wards in Tower Hamlets. Um, so, there was a huge need. I mean, that, as, as, as an aside, that was very important actually in the evolution and the development of the QI program as a whole, um, searching for a new approach to help us with this sort of challenge. Um, but locally, um, they were there and, and they, they wanted to, to work on it in Tower Hamlets and it was Globe Ward that took it on in the beginning. Um, and, you know, as I said, in the evidence base, there was, there was really nothing, nothing to go on, nothing that could really tell us that this was really going to work for the long term, that we could really achieve change in this area of, of reducing violence and aggression. Um, but actually, they started in April 2012, and uh, by October, they'd had uh, what is an 88% reduction. 
they were experiencing consistently four incidents uh, a month um, prior to that. And um, in October, it dropped to an incident every two months. And Globe Ward have sustained that ever since. And we're, you know, we're now four or five years on. So incredible change, really, really quite quickly. What about the next steps, though? We're going to tell you more about what, what they did in a moment. But just to tell you the outline of, of what scale up we've been through, that was Globe Ward in 2012. In late 2014, um, a first stage of scale up happened to the rest of the inpatient unit in Tower Hamlets, which involved six wards, four acute wards and two uh, PQs, psychiatric intensive care unit, our highest acuity ward, people who are most unwell and at risk. Um, that went on for um, about a year and a half, and they are now they're in a stage of ensuring they hold the gains, and they're actually developing, really pioneering our thinking as well about how do we really ensure we do this for a long term in a context which is very challenging. Um, but the change package has now gone to two collaboratives in City and Hackney and Newham, so two groups of seven wards which we run separately um, as unit collaboratives. But connecting back with some of these principles we're talking about, and thinking particularly about this question of compatibility with, with values and understandings, what was it like in 2012? I've said there's not much in the evidence base, but actually, how were people feeling about this? Um, Jonathan Warren, our, our Deputy Chief Executive and Chief Nursing Officer, is very... He shared this thought with me um, a while back about the beginning. And you can see in that actually, wow, not really a, a belief that we could do this, that this is where we should be, you know, hanging our hat. Um, or, you know, or certainly a scepticism about whether this was possible. Um, and what about people on the ground? Well, here's a quote from someone I've worked with in Hackney. I'm, I'm the lead on the Hackney Violence Reduction Collaborative. Um, and you can see you know, this feeling on, on the front line as well. Um, I'm sure some of you will work in these settings, but the, the experience of going to work every day with a real possibility of um, being a victim of violence and aggression or witnessing colleagues or other service users being a victim of violence and aggression, you know, does mean that people build up defences, really understandably. Um, you know, telling yourself this is just how it is, just it's the way it has to be, you know, for me to do this job. Um, but actually, that means it's not that compatible in one sense, and we have to work with that on this issue in the beginning. So it's important to think here that what we were trying to uh, encourage were, was a new way of seeing a very old problem. Something that was so familiar that it was a taken for granted. Uh, that actually changing your view of it was seen to be, if not impossible, relatively pointless. Because surely in our line of work there's going to be uh, loads of opportunity for disagreement, for distress and conflict. And of course, there's, there's certainly a lot of truth in that. But if you view your issues the way you've always viewed them, you'll get what you've always got. So this was really about helping us to think about seeing things differently. And in terms of this question of values and understanding, another really important dimension to emphasise is on my travels to our new settings with this work, there's, there's something very important as well, which is actually it does really matter. Once you can break through some of that, those defences and some of the feelings that it's just not possible, actually people connect with how important it is. And you can facilitate that connection and you know, that's sort of part of what my job is, is to, is to help people connect with that stuff. So to give you an example, the first thing that I do with wards who are starting this work is going to their away days and actually giving them some space to talk with colleagues about what are our experiences of violence and aggression and what is the impact of that. Um, and here's an example from just one ward in Hackney 
of what came out of an honestly 20-minute discussion. Um, you can see how much it was, it was affecting them and their connection of it, obviously, to the impact on service users. Um, and I think this kind of step is, is really important so that people um, connect personally with the issue and have the chance to, to do that sharing with colleagues. So, some thoughts on compatibility. So really, the, the idea of what, what were the changes we were asking people to uh, test and have been asking them to test, and there are various combinations of things, but we felt very clear, we needed to be very clear that these were things that would broadly fit with the way that the teams saw themselves anyway. That the, um, the relative advantage question was a very, very good one. Uh, is just doing another risk assessment going to change anything? No. So what is the change in behaviour that accompanies that that might? And that was certainly one of the triggers when we saw that on Globeboard that really helped to cascade the improvement. The idea that things should be relatively simple. I mean, these, are, these belie a complexity, I have to say, these, uh, these, these interventions, but they are relatively easy to do. And they're relatively easy to do well. <coughs> they just take a bit of practice. So, so that was really a, a, a key element for us. Yeah. Just to say as well, at the end, there's some resources on Slido that will give you more depth on this stuff, um, and we will connect you to those at the end if you want to know more detail about, about these things. Um, but coming back to this, the attributes of innovations, the trialability we've said, it, it's actually in, in the model for improvement that we use, the, the idea of PDSA, um, people being able to test and explore and learn and not have to have the answer at the beginning and not to have 100% confidence in the beginning something's going to work um, because, you know, what improvement science teaches you is, you know, in most cases that is, you can't, that's impossible. You have to build your belief. You will only have theories at the beginning. Empowering people with that, I think, is very powerful. And in terms of observability, well, we'd like to share with you some more results from the wards. Um, we've shown you Globeboard. Across the rest of the unit in Tower Hamlets, we've had a 57% reduction across the acute wards um, and a, a, a region of 50% reduction on the psychiatric intensive care units. Um, in terms of that second stage, Hackney and Newham, uh, we're a year or so in um, with Hackney and we've had reductions across an, a, a number of wards. Um, Newham started slightly later, but we've still got some signs of, of change there. And it's not all about numbers, of course. Um, uh, the, the impact, uh, the, the question of impact on, on the team and the people who are involved in this is, is really important and I think you need to hear their stories um, to give you a flavour of that. So, in terms of Roger's model, it is about making that observable at all opportunities, ward level, unit wide, you know, with leadership, trust wide, and of course things like this where we get to go a bit beyond Elft, which is really nice. Um, but in terms of those other two things about how humans experience change, uh, here is just a flavour of this peer-to-peer -peer connection going on that we've done today. Um, you can see here people coming together, ward level, um, every six weeks we have unit-wide collaboratives in, in Hackney and Newham and we did in Tower Hamlets where people were, were sharing together and you, know, you can see the ways in which the wards have come up with their own ideas for how to foster that leadership, celebrate the leadership and engagement in the work. And that reinvention question, there's loads of it. Again, just a flavour, but you can just see how, how you can make this work fun, how you can make it an opportunity for people to be creative um, and, uh, you know, and, and feel ownership of that. But pacing is important. So the idea here when we're scaling up interventions is working out what's the rate at which we can do this? How much do we know about all those factors existing within both the things, the, 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 uh, the innovations, the changes, the improvements, 
And how much does that sit within a particular context and how ready is that context to take it on? Working that out takes time. Also, teams often get stuck in the doing. If you think of the plan, do, study, act cycle, teams often get stuck in the doing. So they're just relentlessly keeping on going without stepping back to see whether or not it's making any difference in learning together. And so we need to make sure that we're giving teams the opportunity to do that. And that's why we have that rhythm of the uh, collaborative approach that helps, gives a, a, a formal process uh, to do that with. Otherwise, the risk is you will get fade very, very quickly and, you, and your intervention won't have as much impact as you would like. It is worth bearing in mind that there is always room for optimism, even in the most unlikely circumstances. So having that sense of hope that things can work and people can work together, even when they're feeling a bit worn out and a bit tired of it all, is really important. And we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that energy required uh, to, to innovate and improve uh, the work that people do. It's also about taking a different view. It's about seeing things through other lenses. It's about trying to see the world in a slightly different way to the way that we're often led to uh, through our culture, through our childhood, through the way that we choose, the, the kind of social media you use, all of these things, the kind of uh, realities that we build for ourselves. And it's important to get that multiplicity of views. In that sense, it's really important to make sure that the late majority in laggards, if you want to characterise people that way, are in the room with you, thinking about what the relative merits or demerits of a particular idea are. So in conclusion, what we'd say is that in order to help teams uh, adopt improvement, in order to spread improvement at scale, you have to think very clearly about the leadership role and the kinds of leadership that that requires. Um, simply being bureaucratic about it does not work. You have to be engaging, you have to pull people, you have to attract people into doing this work. Um, just simply saying it must do rarely works in my experience with it. <coughs> Context and readiness is important. If a team has a massive attrition rate of staff, that needs to be stabilised. If they do not have a leader, they need one. So trying to put improvement efforts into a, a, a part of a system where it has no fertile ground is not time well spent. Do the other bit first, do all the preparation, and then the, prep, uh, then the improvement may uh, lodge itself. Energy and engagement, which I think you, know, you may have, have picked up from, from Jen, is hugely important for this. The idea that you need to keep going back to it. You know, it's, it's uh, something that you cannot underestimate and it's particularly about bringing people back to what matters to them. Bringing them back to that kind of core set of experiences uh, as, as difficult as they've been. Some of these conversations people have never had in work before and they've found them profoundly moving. Some of the work we've been doing with service users about their experiences of violence has been profoundly moving and really encouraging and giving people a sense of purpose and shared purpose. Phasing your approach is equally important. Not trying to do everything at once. Go everywhere at once. I started off with this work and thought it would be like catching the flu. That people would just get it, you know, whether they wanted to or not. And it couldn't be further from the truth. You need to do it deliberately. And design and support of the learning system. So where does your data sit? How do you make sense of that? What are the stories that accompany that information? So that it's not all about numbers, it's about the things that people can connect with in other ways. And that's really where I think we're, we're at with our ideas around uh, scale up and, and spread. So it's being deliberate, but not too deliberate. It's tuning into what's going on locally without feeling like you're invading and colonising. It's all of those kinds of ideas. It's getting in touch with the working realities and the experiences that people bring to their work and thinking with them about how they can take ideas forward. Thank you very much. So I think, I think we have minutes. time for a couple of questions and we have one from the Slido, which is, 
I'm seeing a real importance of the relevance of the innovation, but relevance differs at different levels of an, of an organisation. For example, factual numbers for man management versus human experience for frontline staff. How do we overcome this challenge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well. <laughs> so numbers matter. We need to be really clear about that. Your evidence is really, really important. But it is about engaging people in the story. So when you look at a dot on a chart, that dot is a person. That, there's a story behind that. There's a, a, a narrative in there. And if you can help people to see that those dots equate to experiences, then you tend to get better engagement in those conversations. And it's making sure that it's part of whatever you're doing has a frequency of um, social presence. So it, it happens, it's spoken about in, in, in every meeting or it's spoken about in, uh, in your interactions with patients and so on. That kind of frequency tends to make the, the data a bit, more, a bit more human and a bit less bureaucratic. Yeah. I think also it's about fostering that understanding at different levels. Um, it's helping people understand if they're you know, in more senior roles the what it is the challenges around doing this stuff on the ground and helping them to see that and understand that um, and you know you can do that partly through education around the model for improvement but but it's also really about sharing sharing that and, and I suppose that, that, that <clears throat> even the people that are really skeptical about the numbers when they actually see the run charts and they see that their team has made an improvement I mean people are won over by that that might be me I think, I think that's what makes a really big difference is even people that say this isn't about the patient, it's not about numbers, when they see that, that there's a change in something, if that's satisfaction or waiting times or, or a anything like that, people really, really like that feeling of they've achieved something and that it's, it's showing something tangible. We were having a discussion earlier as we were having tea something related to what the gentleman was just saying about this is not about the patient but at the end of the day if you're satisfied as a staff if you're happy to go to work and when you were giving those um, feedback sentences you could see staff were happier being at work and actually felt more motivated then I think as a clinician in particular we can not just clinicians but admin as well at the same time can offer better services to service users so it's always about the service user maybe indirectly but I think it does improve the care that, the care that we provide. Uh, ab absolutely. I don't know why I'm using that. Uh, absolutely. The, um, uh, there is a lot of evidence to support that if you are more content at work, you deliver a better uh, service. And good teams, teams that have good, healthy cultures where they're working in things together, tend to have better clinical outcomes. Okay. Everyone, thank you very, very much. Um, on the Slido are some more resources if you want to know any more about the detail of this work. Um, we've had a paper published in the Journal of Mental Health Nursing recently, which is on Slido. Um, some good tips from the IHI around spread as well you might like to look at. Um, Andy and I have also both written blogs about this, particularly I think on this, the human stuff we were talking about today on the IHI. You can go and Google for that. And, and here we are. We are both late joiners to Twitter, but we are on there now. So if, uh, if you are on Twitter or anyone got us convinced, please find us and um, we'd love to keep connecting. If you've got any individual questions, do come up to the front. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. And it's back through this door and then back to the plenary for the sort of final summing up. Thank you very much. <laughs>